Hey, welcome to another episode of 15 Minute Fridays. This week, we're talking about potassium, which source is best, and whether we're putting together a granular fertilizer blend or looking at different liquid options for fertilizer programs, every source of potassium that we have an opportunity to apply has its pluses and minuses. And you might not be up to speed with what the best source is for what the best use is, and that's what we hope to get to today. So let's get started. When you look at potassium need by turf, there's a couple of different threshold values, I guess, that we, we can use for determining if uh, soils are deficient or sufficient um, in uh, whatever nutrient that we're looking to apply. So minimum level of sustainable nutrition. This is a threshold guideline that was developed specifically for turf management. And sufficiency level of available nutrients. This is a, uh, a threshold guideline that's been used for many years. Um, on average, in general, has a has a higher amount of nutrient content recommendation than what you have with minimum level of sustainable nutrition. But by using these threshold values, and I keep using that term threshold values, when you have a soil test, a soil test is going to report in parts per million or pounds per acre, how many or what a level of co or concentration of macronutrients that you have in soil. So for example, MLSN or M minimum level of sustainable nutrition, if I had a soil test report that comes back and says that I have 22 parts per million or ppm potassium, I would compare that here against this 37 ppm threshold guideline. And with my 22 as it registered in the soil, I'd say that I'm deficient in potassium. So that would indicate to me that I need to apply potassium to uh, maintain high quality turf. So when you look at how much potassium is actually needed and what type of form of potassium that needs to be applied, that's where we can start to look at all of your options and really see which one fits best for your agronomic program. But before we get into the different types of potassium, it's important to understand just a couple of, con uh, excuse me, a couple of of definitions that are going to come up a few times today. Salt index. Salt index is the measure of the relative tendency of a fertilizer to increase the osmotic pressure of the soil solution compared to the increase by an equal weight of reference materials, sodium nitrate. Said in simpler words or more easy to understand terms, salt index is the relative measure of how likely a fertilizer source is to burn turf. Second, we're going to look at solubility. Solubility is the amount of a substance that can dissolve in a given amount of a solvent at a specified temperature. Uh, an example of this would be grams of a potassium source per liter of water. And in most cases, when we're talking about solubility for turf applications, we're talking about solubility of a material in water, in carrier water, in spray water, that's going to be applied as a liquid application. So let's get into our different kinds of fertilizer. The first one up is murate of potash. Also, potassium chloride is its chemical name, has an analysis typically of 0062, meaning that it has 62% uh, potash within the mix or 62% K2O within the mix. One downside of this material compared to others, and you'll see why later, is that murate of potash, potassium chloride, it only pr provides one single plant essential nutrient, and that's potassium. Chloride is not a essential nutrient for plant growth. So when you apply this OO62, that's all you're getting is potassium, no other macronutrients. Murate of potash goes by the, the nickname of MOP or MOP. It has a high salt index of 116.3, which means that this material has a very high burn potential. So if you apply the material on a hot, dry day and don't water it in after application, there's a good likelihood that you're going to have uh, some phytotoxic issues on the turf. Uh, murate of potash does have a high water solubility at 340 grams per liter. Again, that means that you can dissolve 340 grams of murate of potash into uh, one liter of water, uh, which makes it attractive or, or at least a attractive option for meltdown foliar type applications. But as we'll see later, even though this is a highly soluble material, that does not mean that it is readily taken up into the plant as a foliar application. Murate of potash is attractive for granular applications or blending into a granular blend because it is relatively affordable. It does have a low cost per pound of potassium. And as I mentioned before, it does have poor foliar absorption characteristics. Here's an example of uh, for, uh, turf burn. This is Bermuda grass that's caused by murate of potash application. This application was made on a hot, dry day and wasn't followed by irrigation. And the murate of potash, as it sat on the turf surface, 
acted as a salt tends to act and it, and it extruded water out of the turf itself and actually leading to these burn characteristics. Next up is sulfate of potash. 0050 is the typical analysis for sulfate of potash. A major benefit for sulfate of potash, or SOP, as it typically goes by as a nickname, is that it provides two plant essential nutrients. If you remember, MOP only gave us potassium, where sulfate of potash will give us both potassium and sulfur. Also has a very low salt index when compared to MOP uh, at 46.1, meaning that sulfate of potash has a very low burn potential when you compare that to murate of potash. A low water solubility at 120 grams per liter means that this material, even when it's in powder form, is not a great option for foliar liquid applications because it just frankly is not going to dissolve very well or readily in carrier water. A kind of middle of the road cost per pound of potassium. It's not as cheap as murate of potash, but it is more affordable per pound of potassium uh, than some other materials that we'll discuss. And similar to murate of potash, sulfate of potash also has poor foliar absorption characteristics. The third granular source that we'll talk about today, this is also available, similar to murate of potash and similar to sulfate of potash. Sulfate of potash, magnesia, or KMAG, or sulpomag, all go by similar names, are all OO22 analyses. These materials are all available for blending within granular fertilizer blends. The neat benefit about sulfate of potash magnesia is that it provides plant available potassium, magnesium, and sulfur. So murate of potash only gives us potassium. Sulfate of potash gave you potassium and sulfur, but sulfate of potash magnesia gives you all three, potassium, magnesium, and sulfur. Similar to sulfate of potash, it has a low salt index of 43.2, low burn potential. It does have moderate water solubility, kind of in between sulfate of potash and murate of potash at 240 grams per liter. However, even though it is a little bit more soluble than sulfate of potash, this material takes a long time to dissolve. So for that reason, it's not a very good meltdown option for spray applied applications. Compared to sulfate of potash and compared to murate of potash, OO22 is a high cost per pound of potassium and per pound of magnesium. So if you are trying to reach a specific target in terms of applied potassium, in terms of pounds per thousand square feet, uh, there are more affordable options at SOP and MOP. However, the ability to include this into a blend to provide both potassium and magnesium in a situation where you need those two nutrients, this is a good option for that use. And then as, as a general rule of thumb, if you're looking for this material in a blend of your fertilizer, it's going to have a reddish tint, and that's from the iron impurities in the, uh, in the raw materials. Moving on to some liquid formulations, uh, we have several that are available to you. Some are going to be used for, for uh, reasons just for potassium supplementation, but then others like this one, Tidal Fight, which is a proprietary potassium phosphite formulation, is going to give you plant-available potassium and is labeled as a fungicide for pythium control. So that's pretty unique about this product. Something new within the last couple of years is that this product actually carries a 0030 fertilizer label and a EPA fungicide label for pythium control and pre um, prevention. Low burn potential application rates are typically at one to five fluid ounces per thousand square feet. So let's look at this actually on some pythium activity. This is a research trial that was conducted at Rutgers University. We looked at uh, pythium control in a stand of ryegrass. So this is mowed at about two to three inches in height. If you've ever been to the Rutgers field day before, the pythium trial is always tucked up against a tree line in a low-lying area. It's over-irrigated. Um, it's a very conducive uh, environment for pythium development. And so if you have a product in this trial that performs well, you've got something in a real life growing scenario that's going to also be a very good product uh, for pythium prevention and control in your agronomic program. So the non-treated is a photograph on the left. In the center is tidal fight at one fluid ounces per thousand square feet. And on the right of the screen is tidal fight at two fluid ounces per 1,000 square feet. Obviously the non-treated has a high level of disease pressure. You can see the voids that were left by the uh, pythium infestation, but even one fluid ounce per thousand square feet provided a decent level of control. There's still some breakthrough in this plot, but then as you step it up to two fluid ounces, you see even more control than what you see at one ounce. 
Moving further now, we look still the non-treat on your left, but you have four ounces, which is typically our standard recommended rate for title fight in the center. And then our high label rate or just above our high label rate actually at six fluid ounces per 1,000 square feet. So really sees a good level of control at four fluid ounces per 1,000 square feet for Pythium Blight. And that's generally where our recommendation lands for this product. In terms of just foliar available potassium, however, Title Fight is a great option, but if you're not looking for the plant health benefits and you're not looking for the Pythium control benefits, our 0025 stress relief formulation is a good alternative. So 25% potassium in this blend, it's an affordable potassium source, but the unique thing about this product, the derived from potassium source is potassium acetate. And if you look back at some old research, this was conducted by Dr. Schaefer and Dr. Reed in 1986 and published in the Journal of Plant Nutrition. They compared a, a, a large number of different potassium sources, and I'm just showing these three for clarity and example sake for this presentation, is that when applied to glycine max, so that's a scientific name for soybean, the amount of potassium absorbed with potassium acetate was 45 or greater than 45% of applied potassium compared to potassium sulfate, which was less than 10%, and potassium chloride or muriate of potash, which was also less than 10%. So thinking about this conceptually, it says that you can apply a fraction of the rate of potassium acetate and actually get the same amount of potassium inside the plant as you would by applying a higher rate of potassium sulfate or potassium chloride. And so when you're thinking about, oh yeah, potassium chloride is my cheapest source, but really the bang for your buck, the amount of potassium that you're actually getting, getting into your plant, potassium acetate in a product like stress relief is probably going to be a better option for you for foliar type applications. So that's our basic, our general blending type uh, granular fertilizers, our raw material type granular fertilizers and murate of potash, sulfate of potash and KMAG, and then our foliar applications and for stress relief and tidal fight. However, when you look at potassium as a nutrient in soil, of all of our macronutrients, at least our cation macronutrients, our positively charged macronutrients, potassium is much more highly susceptible to leaching than other cations such as calcium and magnesium, especially when you're talking about sandy soils such as you might find near coastal areas of the United States. And because of that, you know, potassium is not our cheapest nutrient to apply. Certainly, it's more affordable to apply calcium and magnesium than it is to apply potassium. So we want to use potassium as efficiently as possible. But we can't go out operationally and apply potassium every month like we may need to with a granular application to keep soil levels at an adequate level. So one way to kind of get around that to, to prevent the loss of potassium through leaching is to apply a coated potassium products such as polyon 0050 or coated uh, sulfate of potash, polyon coated sulfate of potash. And so what this technology allows us to do is to time release or consistently release potassium through the polymer coating over time so that potassium remains available to the plant over the release period. A few of the different programs that are common for Polyon 0050 programs. Uh, one the most common that we have for majority of our customers is that during spring core aeration to apply four to six pounds of product per thousand square feet. This translates into approximately two to three pounds of potassium per thousand square feet. If you're not core aerifying, another option that you do have is to apply two pounds of product per 1,000 square feet, followed by brushing and irrigation. And the brushing and irrigation is just to get the granules down past the turf canopy so that they're not picked up by the next mowing event. Or you could apply two to four pounds of product per thousand square feet following needle time airification. Similar to option number two, the two to four pounds product following needle time airification is still a good idea to follow that with brushing and irrigation just to make sure that the 0050 granule gets down into the hole. And not all polymer coated uh, sulfur, sulfate of potashes or murate of potashes for that matter are created equal. We go through some pretty long steps or pretty long processes to identify the best substrates for coating, whether we're talking about potassium or urea or any of our other polyon materials. But kind of as the nature of the coating process, the rounder and more consistent the substrate is, the better the polymer coating is going to be and the more consistent 
the release is going to be as a result. So we might pay a little bit more upfront for our substrates, but for the customer, that means that release characteristics are just going to be that much more consistent and predictable. So when you look at it here on the left, sulfate of potash and murate of potash on the right, you'll notice, especially with the murate of potash, that these substrates can be very angular. And the more angular a substrate is, the more challenging the substrate is to coat consistently and provide a consistent product. And so we do everything that we can to identify and source the most consistent substrates so that we can have the end result of the most consistent product. And what that looks like eventually after we get the product coated, after we have sulfate of potash coated, we do have controlled release characteristics. So this is from our polygraph um, software, which, which can predict nutrient release of all of our controlled release fertilizers over a given set of a uh, given period of time for any specific locations or location throughout the United States. So in this particular scenario, we're looking at an early March application of Polyon 0050 to the Orlando, Florida area. Uh, this was applied at three pounds of potassium per thousand square feet or six pounds of product per 1,000 square feet. And you'll notice that there is a spike in release in week one, but after that you have somewhere in the ballpark range of you know, 0 0.08, 0 0.09 to 0 0.12 pounds of potassium release per week for 24, 25 or so weeks after application. And then you do have a tail of release after that point in time. And we start thinking about the angular nature. If I go back a slide, think about the angular nature of the sulfate of potash substrate. There are going to be a couple of bad actors in these granular substrates during the manufacturing process, and they might have a little bit thicker coating than some of the other materials. And that's really where this tail of release is coming from. But that's not going to be wasted. Your, your turf is going to continue to take up potassium and continue to use potassium. It's just going to maintain a certain level of potassium within the soil for a longer period of time. So that's a quick overview of the different potassium sources that you have available. Certainly not an exhaustive discussion on potassium, but it's important to know that all potassium sources are not created different. And depending on what your agronomic scenario is, there might be one that fits your agronomic plan better than another. I encourage you to contact your Harold's rep for more, but in the meantime, if you want to read more about potassium and how potassium fits into your overall agronomic program, I encourage you to scan the QR code on your screen. This will take you to a recent article uh, published by Harold's of the different potassium sources and why you might use those in your agronomic programs. We'll see you next time.